So here we are in chapter nine, where we're going to talk more about cache memory and virtual memory. Now you may have noticed I hopped over chapter eight. Chapter eight of this textbook is a little more advanced, it talks about kind of beyond the RISC processor into that superscalar, into the Itanium series processors, and really is best left for a more advanced course. And so the second, I'm sorry, the fourth part of our textbook, which is entitled The System, talks a lot about just the internal computer and how it's composed. And so we're going to really dig into cache memory and virtual memory as kind of a, a detour from what we've talked about so far in this course, but understanding memory, as we've probably learned at this point, right? Talking about the microprocessor, they go hand in hand. And we've talked a lot about performance and bottlenecks. And so if we're gonna have problems with our microcontroller architecture, we might have it here in our memory. And so um, we're gonna talk about different types of um, cache memory and virtual memory. And then that way we'll have kind of a foundation for what these terms mean and these different types of memory and how our system is using them. So we begin with cache memory. And the cache memory really, it's, it's a really simple idea and it really helps our computer look as if it has a much faster memory than it really has. Um, memory should be non-volatile, it should be cheap, fast, small, and consume virtually no power, right? That is what we would like. But in reality, each memory technology that we have, at least right now, um, has its own particular characteristics, some of which are mutually exclusive. So we can get fast, expensive memory, or we can get slow, cheap memory. And memory systems invariably use different technologies with each technology kind of making its own contribution to the computer. So taken together, these technologies give the user the appearance of a system with fast, non-volatile, low-cost memory, and we can categorize the various memory technologies into distinct layers that kind of form a hierarchy. So this figure here really describes the classic pyramid-based memory hierarchy. And the memory at the top of this pyramid up here, right, are registers that we've been talking about at this point. Uh, they're the highest speed and the lowest access time. So we can see over here on the side, you know, we have our expensive versus our cheap and our faster versus our slower. Now, remember when we're talking about expensive versus cheap, sometimes, I mean, we're not talking about monetarily, we're talking in terms of access or in, in terms of effort or, or power. And so uh, we talk about this and use a pyramid because it really kind of helps us see and imply <laughs> generally correctly that the quantity of the memory at the top is smaller than the memory at the bottom. And so our on-chip registers that we've learned about so far, we know they provide the fastest memory in a computer. They hold the working data required by the processor. And it's the speed of the register access that makes that load store or register to register architecture so popular. Now registers are fabricated with the same technology as the CPU. They run at the same clock rate. They have no long data paths between them and, and the rest of the CPU. And on-chip registers can be directly ex accessed by the, the CPU. So all other memory, all other external memory has to be accessed via a pathway that involves some kind of memory management, address translation, data buffering, control mechanisms. And so this is what makes those registers fast. Now CPUs only have a handful of registers to store working data and status information. And really that comes down to cost and really what we term to be the domain of the CPU. We don't wanna to try to jam all of the memory we might ever want into that chip. That's just simply not gonna be possible. Registers cannot hold programs. And so we have to kind of develop other methods. So like where does, uh, like what other memory do we have? Like what, what uh, technologies can we use 
to store the information that we need. So we talk about the cache, right? So this is right below the registers and you can see we're comparing here some size and some speed. And so we call this level one cache memory and the size of this memory, it, it order of magnitude, right? Smaller than the main memory, right? Which is down here, right? The DRAM, but the nature of real programs and the distribution of data means that a typical application might use a small working set of the instructions and data for 95% or more of the time. So once cache memory is located on the motherboard, but advances in chip technology have really made it possible to locate substantial caches on the processor chip. Now this is where we come into classifications. We can see that there are two caches, right? Level one and level two here in our pyramid. If the data being accessed is not in the level one cache, the next level down in the memory hierarchy is then accessed, which is the level two cache. Now, not all systems have this level two cache. And in fact, some systems have three, but if the data isn't in the cache, then it has to be retrieved from the computer's main memory, which is that next level down, right? And we can start to see our access times jump pretty considerably as we move down this pyramid. Now, modern PCs and workstations almost invariably use DRAM to implement the main random access memory. And today's PCs might implement somewhere between one gigabyte, 48 gigabytes. I mean, we say that, but I'm talking to you on a computer that's running 128 gigabytes of RAM because I'm, I'm kind of uh, insane like that. Um, I think most modern home motherboards, that's probably the max at this point that we can support as 128. But of course, you know, we get into server systems and we can support a lot more. But because the main memory is volatile, it's necessary to store programs and data in non-volatile memory. And so one of the cheapest storage mechanisms is the hard disk. Now, let me back up for a second. I keep using this term and I wanna make sure that we understand what I'm talking about. Volatile versus non-volatile. Volatile memory means that power has to be attached in order for the memory, the data inside that memory module to be persistent. So we probably know that, or maybe, and maybe we don't, that the DRAM, those sticks of RAM that are on your motherboard, for those of us that are kind of really at that introductory level of hardware, when the power goes off on your computer, nothing stays in there. It's gone, it's, it's just gone. <laughs> and so it's volatile. Non-volatile memory are things like our hard disk drives, where when we load that computer up, all of our files are there. Power does not have to be maintained to the hard disk drive or the solid state drive or whatever kind of non-volatile memory that you're using for that data to persist. And it's a difference in how the data is actually written to the device versus the storage mechanism that we use on volatile based RAM. So as I was saying, one of the cheapest storage mechanisms is that hard disk that stores data in the form of either magnetic patterns on a flat rotating pattern, or we've talked about solid state drives, which kind of mod model our DRAM type storage, but we've essentially found a way for that data to persist. And I'm, I'm not gonna dig too deep into how um, solid state drives work. Uh, it's a fairly easy Google if you wanna go look it up. Um, the book primarily talks about hard drives in terms of the platter style drives, which I think a lot of people today um, maybe think is an outdated technology, but you know, I've talked previously about the still pretty huge difference in um, expense for the size of storage that you're going to get solid state versus uh, platter based. So uh, a lot of computers are still coming with platter based, although if you're using something like a, a Chromebook or an iPad or um, even some laptops like Microsoft Surface and, and things like that, they're, they're moving to those solid state drives simply because moving platters in a moving computer has always posed a problem. Uh, aside from other things like power consumption and, and heat dissipation and things like that. So no tangents, right? 
a hard disk can store a, a lot of data, right? We we can get uh, hard disk drives. I think in the in the realm of um, double digit terabytes at this point for sure. Um, but access time on a hard disk starts to really slow down. The the table here shows um, eight milliseconds. I think the best that a hard disk can probably do at this point, um, and I'm talking about the physical platter type, um, I think is five milliseconds. And so, while that's fast by human standards, like most humans can't think in milliseconds, um, we can see that it's uh, quite a bit, um, like six <laughs> orders of magnitude slower than our main storage. So today, the mechanical hard disk, right, is being replaced by more solid state drives. But again, we're not going to really dig into that right now. So going back to the main store, the main store, right, that's the DRAM. It cannot normally hold all of the programs and data required by the processor. Computers have to implement a memory management system that we call virtual memory. And so virtual memory is the main memory that contains only the data currently being used and the data not in current use remains on the hard disk. So when the processor accesses, da accesses the data um, that's not in the main store, the operating system kind of steps in and swaps in a page. Now, maybe you've heard this term before, a page file. Now, a page file is, it's kind of like a file. Uh, it's a carved out section of your hard disk space, typically somewhere from 4K to 64K of data. You can make your page file bigger or smaller um, from the hard disk to the main store. And so a virtual memory system lets us run programs many times larger than the main store without incurring significant reduction in performance. So a virtual memory system that has like 512 megs of DRAM and a 100 gig hard disk can perform almost as well as a system that has 100 gigs of DRAM. And so virtual memory also provides a means for protecting our data as it moves around. So let's look, go back to our, our pyramid here. And the next step down, right, secondary storage. And a lot of computers these days do not come with secondary storage, which honestly kind of blows my mind. Uh, I'm from the generation that started with, you know, floppies. And then we went to smaller floppies. And then we went to zip drives. And then we went to flash drives and CDs and DVDs and DVD burners. And, and so the fact that these days I basically can't use secondary storage except for flash drives is a little uh, mind bendy. Now I'm not saying you can't put a CD or DVD drive in your computer, but most of them do not come with one anymore. And I always find it kind of entertaining as a professor when I get textbooks from publishers that come with materials on CD. And then I'm like, what am I supposed to do with that? <laughs> so this is the next step down our memory hierarchy. This is our optical storage. So CDs, DVDs, Blu-rays, these optical memory stores can store data. And if you're not familiar with how optical storage works, it's really indentations along a spiral track uh, on the plastic disc. And it's read using a laser that bounces light off the indentations. It's honestly not that big of a leap in technology from what we used to do with records, like vinyl records. Uh, you're welcome to go look it up. It's really kind of fascinating. So the optical memory, it's slower, right? We can see that it's quite a bit slower than the hard disk. And that's mainly because CD and DVDs, they rotate at a fraction of the speed of the platters inside of our hard disks. And we have to think about uh, kind of this uh, latency that happens when the disk needs to spin up. So if you have a disk in that tray and you go to access it, if you've had one of these drives before, you're familiar with this process where suddenly it's like, and it spins up, 
and it uh, then is able to get up to the speed necessary to actually read the data and perform its job. Now, I do want to point out one thing about our pyramid here that's inaccurate in at least one sense. Optical storage is slower than magnetic storage, but it's not generally larger, right? And so we're talking about the difference, um, you know, because we, we represent this as a pyramid, which kind of implies that, you know, things above are smaller than the things below. A CD can hold about 650 megabytes of data. A Blu-ray disc can hold up to 25 gigabytes of data. And a few years ago, really not that long ago, these were truly large quantities of data. And I would argue that they're still large quantities of data. 25 gigs is still a lot. And I know that like modern applications, especially games, are starting to come in this size, which for those of us who went back to, you know, like one gig of storage was a lot. When I download a game and it's 20 gigs, it physically hurts. And so what, what's kind of um, misleading here is that today's hard drives can store a lot more data than optical disks, right? Which this is looks like it's smaller than this secondary storage down here. But optical storage in this case, in this figure, is positioned by speed rather than size. So, you know, we can see that it's, it's slower, um, whereas three terabytes is larger than 25 gigabytes. So don't, don't take that too out of, of context. So before we delve into our memory systems technology, we have to examine the way in which memory is related to the computer system. If the access time of a register in the CPU is less than one na nanosecond, and the access time of a CD drive is over 100 millisecond, or sorry, 200 milliseconds, it's gonna take a lot of effort to manage a system with such diverse memory devices. They're all trying to do the same job, they just don't get data to the same place in the same way, or at least in the same time. So while this chapter is gonna look at the relatively small cache memory that's combined with a larger and slower memory to make the combined system look like large and fast memory, right, basically magic, we're also gonna talk about virtual memory that manages the addresses so we don't have to worry about where data is in memory and allows us to run several programs simultaneously in different regions of memory and automatically loads data from disk when the computer needs it. And we cover cache and virtual memory together because they perform the same task. Both allow a small quantity of fast memory to act as if it were a much larger um, memory by integrating a large quantity of slower memory into the system. Both technologies are concerned with mapping addresses from the computer onto the actual location of data in a memory. So the difference comes in between cache and virtual memory, but as a matter of speed and control mechanisms. Cache memory operates in the nanosecond range and is managed automatically by hardware whereas virtual memory operates in the millisecond range and is managed by the operating system. So if we take a look at this figure here, you know, all the CPU has to do is, um, when, it, when it's reading instructions, the operand, you know, like time from memory, if we wanted to, to read in some instructions, all the CPU has to do is put the address of wherever that would be on the address bus and then read the data. And in principle, it, it really couldn't be simpler, but we can take a look at this figure that illustrates the type of system that might execute some code and the address of an operand from the computer. And, you know, I mentioned that like an, an operand named time as a logical address. This address goes to the fast cache memory 
where it tries to access the operand. And if the data is in the cache, it's accessed from the cache. Otherwise, if the data is in the slower main memory, it'll be brought from the main memory and loaded both into the computer and into the cache. And so this transfer is implemented in the hardware and it's invisible to the programmer and it's invisible to the operating system because again, that cache memory is managed automatically by the hardware. So if we take a look at this, we can kind of see how this is working and going back to that last statement where I said it's gonna be loaded both into the computer and the cache, the system does this because statistically, if you've asked for a piece of data once, you're likely to ask for it again, uh, like soon. So we load it into the cache so that it's there should you ask for it again. So as we said, sometimes the data, it, maybe it's not even in main memory, it's in the hard disk. So if you're executing instructions and the data is on the disk, then the virtual memory mechanism is going to copy it from disk to the main memory. And it will also be copied into the cache memory for the reasons that I just stated. So the data that's transferred from disk to main memory may go almost anywhere in the main memory, right? It's, it's the job of the memory management unit that we can see here in this figure that translates the logical address from the computer, which is the place where the computer thinks the data is located, into the physical address of the data, which is the place where the operating system actually put it in memory. So virtual memory management is one of the principal tasks of the operating system, and it requires close cooperation between the special purpose hardware of the memory management unit and the operating system. So let's talk a little bit about the importance of cache memory, because it's really impossible to overstress the importance of cache memory in today's world because we have this ever widening gap between the speed of processors and the speed of DRAM. And we have to make use of that cache basically as mandatory in order to bridge that gap and help computers continue to feel fast. So th there's an example here, right? We suppose a high performance 32 bit processor. Uh, now we didn't talk about the superscalar designs, but you know, just bear with me. It can execute four instructions per clock cycle at a thousand megahertz. So one cycle time is one nanosecond. In order to operate at this speed, the processor would require four times four, which is 16 bytes of data from the cache every nanosecond. If the data is not in the cache, we know it has to go and be fetched, right? From the DRAM memory, which takes 50 nanoseconds. So let's think about that for a second. We need 16 bytes of data every one nanosecond, but it takes 50 nanoseconds to get it from the memory over a 32-bit bus, right? So we can see the math. Four times 50 is 200 nanoseconds to fetch four instructions. Now, I know we're talking about extremely small speeds, but when we're putting that, we have to put that in relation to how fast our processor, our CPU actually works. And so this corresponds to the time it would normally take to execute our four times 200, right? Would, would be 800 instructions. But this is why it's so important that we have this cache and that we use it because otherwise it's gonna be impossibly slow to get anything done and your user is gonna be sitting there waiting for stuff to load. And as computers have gotten faster, our attention spans have gotten lower. And we study this a lot when we talk about web development and page load times, people will not wait for things to load like they used to. We either think there's a problem and we'll try to like refresh or redo or kill the application or something because we think there's a problem um, if something's hanging um, or we just think this system is really slow and something is wrong with it. It's maybe, you know, it's got spyware, or it's bogged down, or there's something going wrong with the hardware. So if you're making your users wait, then invariably they think something is wrong. Um, and, and we won't, we just simply won't wait patiently for results like we used to 
uh, when computers were much slower. So let's dig a little deeper. The main memory that holds programs and data in our von Neumann computers should be as fast as the CPU requires. That would be ideal, right? So the, if the CPU accesses data or an instruction and the memory can't supply it within the current cycle, the memory must return a signal telling the CPU to wait. A CPU waits by inserting idle or wait states in that machine cycle to prevent it from continuing on to the next operation because it doesn't have what it needs. During a wait state, the CPU just ceases normal operation and slow memory can seriously degrade the performance of your computer because you're just sitting there doing nothing for a long periods of time. So we're gonna look at how cache memory offers a way of substantially increasing the processor's performance without incurring an excessive economic penalty. So we'll taking a look at this figure here, uh, 9.3, which kind of reminds us of the memory hierarchy, but describes delays in terms of clock cycles. So we can also see broken out over here on the side, right? This is the processor, right? We've got our registers, and then we're gonna assume two levels of cache. And so our registers, we're gonna say L1 and L2 caches are managed by the computer. So everything up here, this is managed by the hardware, again, like we said, automatically. If there's a level three cache on board, uh, and then the DRAM, this is semiconductor system memory, and these are board level components. So maybe you've built your own computer, and you, you know, you're that kind of person, which I, I, I'm right there with you, I build my own systems. You've researched uh, motherboards, you understand components, you've looked and compared and, and kind of know things at kind of this deeper level. You've probably seen that, you know, some boards come with different levels of onboard cache, they tell you how fast, they tell you how big, and so when you're shopping, you can kind of start to see how this is important. Now this is the board level components and systems. And there's some overlap here of this being managed by the operating system versus it being managed by the hardware. And you see that this level three cache isn't managed by either. And, and we'll, we'll get to that because it's, it's kind of a special case. And so then as we dig down into those managed by the operating system, Right, our DRAM, that's those sticks of RAM, and then our hard disk, and then again, those optical drives. So year by year, the computer gets faster and memory gets faster. So we're gonna talk a little bit about history so we can understand this concept of the memory wall. So going back to the early 1990s, it was common to see comments in journals expressing the sentiment that there's no point in building or using high-speed CPUs because all they do is wait faster because we've been having this problem for decades now. The solution to the designer's dilemma of memory basically holding up CPU performance is to build faster memory that can keep up with the CPU. Now, that might sound easy to do <laughs> since CPU and memory technologies are linked to each other. They both employ the same design and fabrication processes. It's tempting to argue that a CPU with a cycle time of five nanoseconds requires a memory component with an access time of five nanoseconds. But there are flaws in this approach. First, uh, it's a historical fact that the rate of increase in the speed of processors has far outstripped the increase in DRAM speeds. And we can see that here in this figure. Second, a CPU with a machine cycle time, right? The time taken by the processor to execute a read or write access to external memory of five nanoseconds might have a clock cycle time of only two and a half nanoseconds because each CPU machine cycle is executed in two clock cycles. So suppose the CPU with its five nanosecond machine cycle time, spends a clock cycle performing internal housekeeping tasks. The processor then requires data in only one clock cycle, measured from the time in which the address is first available to the time in which data from the memory is latched. The access time of the memory needed to keep up with the CPU is therefore two and a half nanoseconds. So consequently, there's a demand for memory with access times well below those of the stated machine cycle times of the processors that they serve. 
So although modern technology does indeed produce memory components with access time below five nanoseconds, the cost of such devices prohibits their use in large memory systems. A large scale economic production of personal computers and workstations that happened in the mid 1990s demanded the use of tried and tested main mainstream memory components. So we started with our 16 megabit DRAMs. They had an access time of 50 nanoseconds. And so the, that cutting edge stuff that actually works as fast as we need, it's way too expensive. So really what it comes down to is that there's nothing mysterious about cache memory. It's just very high speed memory that can be accessed rapidly by the processor. The magic comes in from the ability of systems to employ a modest amount of high speed memory. So like 256K in a system with 512 megabytes of DRAM and then expect the processor to make 95% of its accesses to the cache rather than the DRAM. So the effect of different rates of change in the performance of memory and processors has been well studied. And it's argued that the lag in the speed of DRAM compared to processors will eventually prove to be the limit on computer performance. Researchers say that processing time is the sum of the time performing internal operations plus the sum of the time spent accessing external memory. And therefore, memory access components will eventually dominate. And any further progress in processing power is going to be pointless. And so this is the expression, or where we get this expression, to uh, hitting the memory wall. Um, this suggests there's a finite limit to progress in conventional microprocessor systems design. And cache has no intrinsic value. Buses distribute data, hard disks store large volumes of data. Caches are simply there to hide memory latency. So if we could figure out how memory could go faster, we wouldn't need the cache. So let's talk about the structure of cache memory. The general structure of a cache memory system can be seen here in the figure. We have a block of cache memory that sits on the processor's address and data buses in parallel with the much larger main store. Data in the cache is also maintained in the main store. So cache memory uh, is duplicated in the main store. We know that it ultimately comes from the main store because it's copied in from there. The book uses this analogy of a telephone list. I honestly don't know who keeps telephone lists anymore. When I was growing up, we had to know each other's phone numbers because uh, you had to dial them on the phone <laughs> and our phones didn't keep them for us. And so you had a phone list. Um, the book's analogy of a telephone list, I think is maybe a little outdated for today's uh, student, but um, you know, they talk about the computer access as a memory location the probability that even, even the probability that any given memory location will be accessed is not constant. And since some locations are more likely to be accessed than others, we have this way of determining what goes into the cache and what doesn't. Because the nature of programs and their data structures, the data required by the processor is often highly clustered throughout memory. It's not just like all over the place. So the stack may be accessed very regularly and some functions are called more often than others. And we call this phenomenon um, locality of reference. And so this is really our principle of locality. And so this is kind of what makes cache memory possible. It's some addresses are said to exhibit spatial locality because they're clustered within the same region of memory or the same data structure. And the programmer, the programmer and the compiler, they have a considerable degree of control over special locality. Um, so suppose a program has variables P, Q, and R. So P is an integer, R is an array of eight integers, and Q is another integer. And then suppose P and R are accessed frequently, but Q rarely. 
If the data is declared in the order of P, R, and Q, the two frequently accessed items are going to be next to each other in memory, and they may be cached together. And so some addresses are said to exhibit um, temporal locality, right? So we have these two ideas of um, spatial and temporal locality. And because they're accessed over and over again within a short time span, so we can think about like locations accessed within a loop. So if you had a for loop that contained P, then that's gonna give us access to the same variables in a regular pattern over time. So the principles of locality is a guide rather than a law. And some programs display both spatial and temporal locality and others don't. But a program with a very large matrix with data arranged at random might not exhibit any spatial locality. A database of mail order consumers indexed by geographical location might have a high degree of spatial locality because some communities may be frequent users of the service. And so there's just some ways that we can kind of predict what should be in the cache. And then the cache uses a cache controller to determine whether the operand accessed by the CPU resides in the cache or whether it must be obtained from the main memory. So there's essentially, you know, like a, a little traffic controller in there um, who kind of determines where the information is. And so when the address is supplied to the cache controller, the controller returns a signal called a hit. So kind of like Battleship that <laughs> determines whether the cache access uh, was successful or not. And just like Battleship, if it's not in the cache, it will return a miss. So the logical complement of this, right, hit or miss, and a miss indicates, you know, the data is not in the cache and the cache must be reloaded from memory. And so it has to go out to the DRAM and get it. So modern high performance systems have multiple levels of cache, right? We saw that in our pyramid. We have our level one cache, level two, level three. Level one, or, or L1 cache is the smallest and the fastest. If data isn't in the L1 cache, then we go to L2 and we search there. If the data isn't there, we go to the L3 cache and search. And so multiple levels of caches are cost effective because they provide better performance without increasing the size of the fastest cache. And so we kind of have all of these multiple levels just because we, we need all of this space and then it's just cost effective to do so. So the section on cache performance is very math intensive. We do need to know much about um, how the cache memory affects a computer's performance. And we need to know this, you know, before we decide whether adding cache memory is cost effective. And we can build some simple models that kind of omit fine details of real cache systems, or we can um, come up with different types of predictive models with this like hit miss ratio and things like that. It is fairly math intensive. So I'm gonna hop over that and just talk about this section right here, other ways of looking at performance. Because there's really several ways of expressing the performance of cache memory. Some writers express it in terms of miss rates um, and penalties. So how many times did we basically guess wrong? Um, sometimes we include the CPU performance in the equation. So how many wait cycles are we having to move through, right, install? And there's sometimes difference in the way in which cache equations are expressed, which depends on the assumptions made about the system. So there's several cache equations that you can see here. That's really all I want to talk about in terms of performance. So we're going to talk about cache organization. Really, if the cache holds only a tiny fraction of the available memory space, let's talk about what data goes into it and where do we put it. So cache memory systems are harder to design and to integrate into computer systems than main stores, partially because of the high speed of cache memories and partially because of their complexity. So until the, um, about the 1980s, Cache memories were really only seen in mini computers and mainframes. It, it really wasn't cost effective enough yet to put these into uh, our regular computers, but not really that anyone had regular computers. Um, you know, in the, in the late 1980s, you know, we had the advent of the um, 68020, 
um, and the 30 and the 486 generation uh, of microprocessors. And that's when caches really started to appear in personal computers. And today, the ability to put more than a billion transistors on a chip ensures that all high performance processors include a large cache memory on chip. But again, talking about you know shoving transistors on a tiny chip die, we just weren't there yet with the technology to be able to make that as prevalent as it needed to be. So the fundamental problem of cache memory design is how to create a memory that contains a set of data elements that can come from anywhere within a much larger main store. And there's many ways of solving this mapping problem, although all practical cache systems use what's called set associative uh, organization. And so before we describe this, we're going to look at two possible cache organizations that will help us understand the operation of the set associative cache. So we have to ask ourselves when we're designing a memory system, how large or how small should the basic unit of data be? And because main memories handle data in units that are equal to the fundamental word length of the machine, remember like 64-bit machines with 64-bit registers, they use 64-bit memory. If the computer wants to read less than a full word, so it's a maybe a 32-bit application, it reads a word and then it ignores the bits that it doesn't want. So although a computer can read a word from a cache memory, the word is not the basic unit of storage in a cache. The unit of storage is the line that contains several consecutive words, right? So hopefully that terminology feels right. Lines are made of words. Suppose a cache were organized by the granularity of a word. If an instruction were accessed and it wasn't currently in the cache, it would have to be fetched from the main store. However, the next instruction would probably be a miss too. So we need a bigger unit than a word because most likely we're pulling in more data than that. So a cache line consists of a sequence of consecutive words allowing several consecutive instructions to be read from the cache without causing a miss. So when a miss does occur, the entire line that contains the word being accessed is transferred from memory to the cache. And then the optimum line size for any system depends on the total size of the cache. So the nature of the code and the instruction of the data, all of it is, is taken into account. We would like a cache that places no restrictions on the data that it can contain. So that would be data in the cache can come from anywhere within the main store. And if such a cache works this way, we call it a, an associative memory because it can store data anywhere in it because the data is accessed by its value and not by its address. So we have this idea of this fully associative mapped cache. And so let's take a look at the um, figure here that illustrates a concept of an associative memory. So each entry has two values. We have a key and a data element. And hopefully, I mean, if you're in software development, maybe you've heard of like key value pairs. This is the exact same principle. So the top line here at 52B1, right, first key, and that data that we can see in the data field, right, the data is not ordered in the sense that an entry can go anywhere in the memory. The key is the primary means of retrieving the data. An associative memory is accepted by applying a key to the main memory input and then matching it with all keys in the memory in parallel. So if the key is found, then that, the data at that location that's associated with that key is retrieved. So in example, right, suppose the computer wants to apply the key F001. So we can see this highlighted here, right? This is our key. And this key is applied to all locations in the memory simultaneously and then because a match takes place with this key, the memory responds by indicating a match, right, a hit, and then supplying the value, which is this right here, at its data terminals, 
So let's look at some of the details of a fully associative cache memory. And this figure here describes an associative cache that allows any line in the cache to hold data from any line in the main store. So in this example, the memory is divided into lines of two words. An associative cache can be of any size, and there's no relationship between the number of lines in the cache and the number of lines in the main memory. So if we consider a system with 16 megabytes of main store and 64 kilobytes of associative map cache, if the size of a line is four 32-bit words, right, 16 bytes, then we could figure out that the main memory would be composed of one megabyte lines, and then the cache would need to be 4,096 lines. So let's compare this to the direct mapped cache, because the easiest way to organize a cache memory employs direct mapping. This relies on a simple algorithm to map da the data block, which we're going to call I, in the cache from the main memory. So in a direct mapped cache, the lines are arranged into units called sets, where the size of a set is the same size as the cache. So if we refer to our previous example, uh, a computer with 16 megabyte memory and a 64 kilobyte cache would divide the memory into 16 megabytes over 64 kilobytes, which is 256 sets. So we can illustrate how this works here in the figure. And we can look here and see how this demonstrates how the word currently addressed by the processor is accessed in memory via its set address, its line address, and then its word address. So for the purposes of this discussion, we need to consider only the set and line as it doesn't matter how many words there are in a line. And so this arrangement in the figure, this is called the direct mapped cache because there's a direct relationship between the location of a line in the cache and the location of the corresponding line in memory. And in this example, the cache memory has a two bit line address. So it holds two to the two, which is four lines. If a direct map cache is a B bit line address field, then the cache must hold two to B lines of data. So in a direct mapped cache, it does not require a complex line replacement algorithm. And if line X in set Y is accessed and a miss takes place, then line X from set Y in the main memory store is loaded into the frame for line X in the cache memory. So there's no decision concerning which line from the cache is to be rejected. Um, we don't have to basically make that determination when a new line is to be loaded. So one of the advantages of the direct map cache is the inherent uh, parallelism where the cache memory holding the data and the cache tag RAM are independent. They can both be accessed simultaneously so once the tag field from the address bus has been matched with the tag field from the cache tag RAM and a hit has occurred, the data from the cache will also be valid. So there's a, also some disadvantages uh, to a direct mapped cache. And really it's the sensitivity to the location of the data that's to be cached. So we can relate this to the domestic address book, right? That we talked about wasn't really a great um, analogy. <laughs> Um, but if you have, you know, half a dozen slots for each letter in the alphabet and you make six friends whose surname begin with S, you have a problem the next time you meet someone <laughs> with the surname of S because your book is full. I don't know. Maybe you have to just decide you have to no more friends with last names of S, right? It's annoying because Q and X slots are entirely empty. There's not a lot of people with these last names. Um, because only one line in the number X may be in the, uh, maybe in the cache at any instant, accessing data from a different set 
but with the same line number will always flush the current occupant of line X in the cache. So even when the cache is not full, lines may have to be swapped in and out because two lines with the same number, but from different sets are being accessed. And this situation can lead to a low cache utilization and a high miss ratio. So if you like some examples, the book has some figures, basically snapshots of like a direct mapped cache uh, while it's running a program kind of step by step. If you find these kinds of like visual examples helpful, by all means, I encourage you to kind of walk through them and read them. So next we're gonna talk about our set associative cache, right? So the direct mapped cache that we just described, we said it was easy to implement, but it doesn't require uh, a line replacement algorithm, which is good. But the downside is then it doesn't allow two lines with the same number from different sets to be cached at the same time. So a fully associative cache places no restriction on where data can be located, but it requires a mean of choosing which line to eject once the cache is full. And any reasonably large associative cache would be really expensive to construct. So we have the set associative cache, which kind of combines the best features of both of the types of caches. It's not expensive to construct. And consequently, this is the form of cache that we find in all of the computers that you've probably ever used. So a direct map cache has only one location for each line of I. And if you operate two direct map caches in parallel, then line I can go in either cache. If you have N direct mapped caches operating in parallel, line I can go in one of I locations. That's an N way set associative cache. So in an N way set associative cache, there are N possible cache locations that a given line can be loaded into. And so let's take a look at a figure here, which illustrates the structure of our four-way set associative cache. So it consists of four direct mapped caches operated in parallel. And this arrangement, we can see line I can be located in any of the four direct mapped caches. So consequently, the chance of multiple lines with the same line number leading to a conflict is considerably reduced. And this arrangement is associative because the address from the processor is fed to each direct map cache in parallel. However, instead of having to perform a simultaneous search of thousands of memory locations, only two to eight direct map caches have to be accessed in parallel. So the response from each cache, right, hit or miss, is fed to an OR gate that produces a hit output if any cache indicates a hit. Right, and we can see this kind of as we progress how this works. So taking a look at this figure, it repeats the previous example from our set associative cache and everything is the same except that the direct mapped cache only has four lines. There are two caches making a total of eight lines as before and there is a two-way set associative cache where a line may be cached in the upper, right? We see that in the light blue or in the lower in the dark blue direct mapped cache. And basically everything is the same and until we get to the point where we might have that uh, duplication. So here's what happens, right? So if we have this instruction at address 10, mapped into line two, which is a set size of four, it's currently being occupied by this instruction. So we can see that the corresponding location in the second cache in the associative pair is free, and therefore the instruction can be cached in location two of the lower cache without ejecting line two from the upper cache. So there's a lot more on this topic of caches that we could cover getting into um, some more complex topics um, such as categories of a miss, 
um, pseudo associative type caches, annex, victim, trace caches, considerations of design. There's quite a bit going on in chapter nine, but our purpose here, kind of from a beginner architecture standpoint, is to understand the different types of caches, why we use, what we use, and how they work from, from a beginner standpoint. Now we're gonna talk about virtual memory and min memory management, but for the sake of our brains, I'm going to stop here as the end of part one, and then pick up with virtual memory and memory management in section 9.5 in part two of our chapter nine lecture. So if you wanna keep going, uh, load up that next lecture. Otherwise, I'd say go back over what we've covered so far, take a look at some of those figures, walk through some of those cache diagrams so that you just have a, a good understanding of what we've been talking about so far.